Oh, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of John Barnett? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. John Barnett was born on February 23, 1962, in central Louisiana, which is also referred to as the Crossroads. He went by two different nicknames during his life, Mitch and Swampy. He was the youngest of four brothers. In 1985, John started working for the Boeing Company at their plant in Everett, Washington. This is just north of Seattle. Boeing is a corporation that manufactures a variety of products, including airplanes, rockets, satellites, and telecommunications equipment. In his role as a quality manager, John oversaw the work of 15 mechanics. His job was to make sure that the aircraft manufactured by the plant were safe. That particular Boeing plant produced the 747, the 767, and the 777. During his time there, John believed that the facility was safe, well-managed, and productive. In 2010, John was transferred to the Boeing facility in North Charleston, South Carolina, where the 787 Dreamliner is manufactured. This is a wide-body twin-engine jetliner designed for long-haul applications. According to John, what he witnessed at that plant was much different than his experience at the Everett, Washington plant. In South Carolina, he oversaw 50 mechanics instead of the 15 in Washington. Some of the mechanics were not well trained. John claimed that many of them had been flipping burgers a month before coming to work for Boeing. As part of the manufacturing process, slivers of titanium were generated. John claimed that instead of being cleaned up, these slivers were left on the floor of the Dreamliner near electronic equipment. He was worried that these slivers would penetrate wires and cause a disaster. After all, the Dreamliner is a fly-by-wire aircraft. In addition, John found other problems. For example, 25% of the emergency oxygen systems did not work. The plant was not keeping track of defective parts. Some of these defective parts were installed in airplanes without being repaired. And John was upset that the plant smelled like french fries. It's not clear how that last item was evidence of a safety problem. Maybe it was simply an artifact of all those mechanics who had recently worked in burger joints. John came to believe that Boeing simply wanted to push unsafe aircraft out of the door for profit. He told his managers about all the violations that he witnessed. For his trouble, he was reprimanded for documenting process violations. Boeing told him that they did not want him to create a paper trail. Rather, he was to verbally address issues and work in the gray areas. In 2017, John was transferred to the Material Review Segregation Area. Ironically, this is a storage location where non-conforming parts go to die. It's like the land of the misfit toys. Unfortunately, the mechanics did not always honor the spirit of this area. On occasion, they would retrieve parts that were defective and install them in aircraft. John repeatedly changed the locks but was ordered to give out a large number of keys to the storage area. Working for Boeing was challenging for John. He felt as though he had been discriminated against and was the victim of retaliation. His complaints were ignored, and the company denigrated him. He filed a whistleblower complaint with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, otherwise known as OSHA. A few weeks later, he resigned because he was not coping well with the effects of the stress. For example, he had anxiety and panic. John moved to Pineville, Louisiana, after his early retirement. After reviewing John's complaints, OSHA determined that there was not enough evidence to support the accusation that Boeing had engaged in wrongdoing. In response, John filed a lawsuit against Boeing, claiming that they retaliated against him because he was a whistleblower. He was looking for over a million dollars in damages due to emotional distress being passed over for promotion, and being forced to retire early. John had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and panic attacks. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. On Thursday, March 7, 2024, 
John was in Charleston, South Carolina, for a deposition in his case against Boeing. This deposition, which was being held at a downtown law office of the firm representing Boeing, was ahead of a trial scheduled for June. John had driven his orange 2015 Dodge Ram pickup truck from Louisiana to South Carolina because he was no longer willing to fly. He stayed at a Holiday Inn on Savannah Highway. For seven hours, John answered a long series of questions from the attorneys for Boeing. He talked about the production mistakes that he allegedly witnessed in Boeing's North Charleston factory. On the next day, Friday, March 8, the deposition continued. This time, John was answering questions from his attorneys. His testimony concluded at 4 p.m. because John was tired and did not want to testify any more that day. This was a problem because John's participation in the deposition was only scheduled for two days. He was planning to start his drive home to Louisiana that night. The deposition did not have to be completed until March 30, but the attorneys for Boeing wanted John to complete his testimony. He reluctantly agreed, just wanting to get the testimony over with. John extended his stay at the Holiday Inn accordingly. He intended to drive to the law firm the next day at 10 a.m. to complete the deposition. At 9.24 a.m. on Saturday, March 9, 2024, a groundskeeper at the Holiday Inn heard a pop sound, but didn't think anything of it. When John failed to show up at the law office at 10 a.m. as planned, one of his attorneys called the hotel. The staff at the hotel found John's Dodge Ram in the rear parking lot and investigated. Just before 10.20 a.m., they contacted emergency services. When the police arrived, they found John in his pickup truck with a gunshot wound to his head. In his right hand, there was a silver handgun with his finger on the trigger. A crumpled piece of paper was found on the passenger seat. The police did not reveal what was written on the paper. A relative of John's would later tell one of his attorneys that the content of the note did not sound like John. The attorneys for John released a statement saying that John was brave, honest, and had a high level of integrity. He cared about family, friends, the Boeing company, his co-workers, and people who flew on Boeing aircraft. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. During the time when John was talking to the media about Boeing's lack of interest in resolving safety concerns, there were a number of high-profile incidents with Boeing aircraft. One occurred just a couple of months before John's death. On January 5, 2024, a Boeing 737 MAX 9 carrying 177 people departed Portland, Oregon at 5.07 p.m. with the destination of Ontario, California. About 10 minutes after taking off, a 60-pound door plug at row 26 separated from the fuselage. It landed in the backyard of a home in Portland. A door plug is a component that is used to fill unused emergency exits. Carriers use them to save money in aircraft that require fewer emergency exits due to having fewer passengers. When the plug blew out, the plane was traveling at 440 miles per hour at an altitude of 16,000 feet. Despite the deafening noise, the passengers remained eerily calm, although one young man had a decompression-assisted shirt removal. The 737 MAX landed without incident at 5.27 p.m. No major injuries were reported. Luckily, there was no passenger seated next to the door plug, or they may have found themselves on the ground prior to the other passengers. Most aviation experts advise against having a gaping hole in the fuselage of a passenger jet because the interior could become uncomfortably breezy. In addition, the aircraft could crash, killing everyone aboard. Some people have noted that the 737 MAX is a different aircraft than the 787 Dreamliner, which is manufactured at the plant where John worked. John had a response for this observation suggesting that the safety concerns affected multiple products, not just the aircraft he worked with. He said, quote, this is not a 737 problem, this is a Boeing problem, unquote. Item number two, whistleblowers often find themselves in stressful situations, which represent no-win scenarios. It is not unusual for whistleblowers to incur legal fees, have trouble finding another job, find themselves without any friends, 
and be viewed as trying to destroy a company that provides much-needed jobs. Some whistleblowers are even accused of being attention-seeking, greedy, vindictive, and petty. People may view a whistleblower as a disgruntled worker who simply wants revenge. All the stress of being a whistleblower can lead to paranoia, anxiety, panic, depression, and other mental health symptoms. In the case of John Barnett, he reported anxiety and panic. A few companies handled the complaints of whistleblowers in a productive way, but most feel threatened and retaliate. Nobody wants a whistleblower working for them, even companies that try to behave ethically. Once someone blows the whistle, they become damaged goods for life. Most whistleblowers have a pro-social motivation, although of course some do not. But what's important is the information that they share with the public and with the authorities. Companies need to be held responsible when they violate the rules. John's death highlights the need for whistleblowers to be offered more protection by the law. Item number three, the unusual nature and timing of John's death has led to some people believing that Boeing could have been involved, like the company had a motive to eliminate him. Let's take a look at the evidence, both for and against the idea that Boeing had something to do with John's death, starting with the inculpatory factors. John was a well-known whistleblower who cost Boeing a lot of money and damaged the company's reputation. When John died, he was just about to provide more testimony against Boeing. With John out of the picture, the viability of his lawsuit is uncertain. It can still move forward, but without John, the chances of victory are decreased. He was a key witness. If John had fired the gun, statistically, there is about a 75% chance that the gun would not remain in his hand, yet the police found it in his hand. A friend told the media that John told her that if he ended up dead, he did not do it himself. John's attorney suggested that he was in very good spirits. There was no indication of a major problem. Moving to the exculpatory factors, there is no evidence that anyone else was near John when he died. He was in his own pickup truck. He had already delivered two days of testimony in the deposition. If Boeing wanted him dead, why not kill him before he offered any testimony? Regardless of when John died, his death was bad news for Boeing. It only hurts their reputation further because it makes it look like they were involved in wrongdoing. Boeing was better off with John alive. There are many other people who blew the whistle on Boeing in addition to John. None of them died under mysterious circumstances. In November of 2022, not even a year and a half before his death, John's wife died of brain cancer. When considering the evidence, do I think that Boeing was involved in John's death? No, I don't think the company was involved. The stress of being a whistleblower can be unbearable. One could argue that Boeing indirectly contributed to John's death by creating a toxic work culture and retaliating, but I would be surprised if they were directly involved. Now moving to my final thoughts. John Barnett was a hero who sacrificed his career and his mental health to protect airplane passengers and crew from corporate greed. He struggled to navigate turbulent skies in an effort to keep everyone else soaring above the clouds. Those are my thoughts on the case of John Barnett. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.